My name is Andrew Peterson and welcome to day two of G'day Glasgow. It's now a minute past 6 p.m. here in Sydney, Australia, and a minute past the hour of 7 a.m. in the city of Glasgow on day two of COP26. Welcome to the program. The program is being broadcast to you from the land of the Camaragal people, and we acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging, and we particularly welcome any First Nations people. Well, let's kick off, shall we? Rarely as a cop venue felt so full and near chaotic, perhaps particularly so because the smaller lives that many have led during the pandemic outside the queues, as you can see, to enter have bulged to overflowing. Many attendees have faced up to two hours um, at any one time in line to enter the venue, prompting comparisons with Copenhagen, which is not good, and delays to the start of formal negotiations uh, negotiations on issues inside the venue. Nevertheless, alongside leader speeches, negotiations did kick off in earnest with new iterations of draft text on several issues for rapid delivery. So, and according to BJT or Boris Johnson time, it's one minute before midnight. This was his warning to the 100 high level officials at the opening plenary on the 1st of November. The United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, pleaded for more aggressive steps to curb climate change during his opening remarks, signaling his concern that COP26 won't lay the groundwork to put global emissions on a sustainable path. And in apologizing for former President Trump's decision to withdraw the US from the Paris Climate Accord, President Biden warned that every day we delay, he said, strong action on climate change the cost of inaction increases and urge the world to de help developing countries so that, in his words, they can be our partners in this effort. And the US president, unfortunately, will leave the COP with nothing to announce in Glasgow to spur on the climate, uh, the COP26 agenda, rather, in that all-American way the president likes to at global summits. Because his Democrat colleagues tried to pressure powerful US Senator Joe Manchin into voting for a bill with bigger climate change investments, but then failed. But it's not all gloom. Pledges have been made in the last 24 hours. India's Prime Minister, Rahendra Modri, Narendra Modri rather, has found the elixir to a healthy carbon-free life. Well, he announced five elixirs. Crucially, this pledge is a net zero by India by 2070. The prime minister of one of the world's biggest carbon emitters also called on rich countries to help fund decarbonisation in developing countries. Thailand also announced a new net zero target and the Republic of Korea's increase of its emissions reduction target to 40% below 2018 levels by 2030 actually represents an improvement from its previous nationally determined contribution of 24.4% below 2017 levels. And there was the formal launch of the Global Methane Pledge, with over 70 countries pledging to collectively lower methane emissions by 30% by 2030 from 2020 uh, 30, 20 levels. Let's turn to finance, and there were announcements there as well. Spain announced its contribution of US dollar 30 million to the Adaptation Fund uh, in 2022, and, and a commitment to increase its climate finance by 50% by 2025. Boris Johnson also offered 1 billion pounds of climate finance from the UK aid budget. And interestingly, Scott Morrison made his address at the COP26 climate summit, and two noticeable things about his speech jump out at us. The first is that he pledged $2 billion towards climate finance, focusing on the Indo-Pacific region. And interestingly, and we'll talk to our um, uh, COP stars in a few moments, he also said that Australians' emissions will fall by 35% by 2030. That last part is interesting because he'd previously been pitching that as a forecast rather than as a target. Let's move on to a bit of business news and the um, stunning announcement that dozens of the world's leaders, including business, representing over 85% of the world's forests, have now vowed 
on Monday to reverse deforestation and land degradation by 2030. And whilst the picture of the room of negotiations doesn't look that exciting in the top right-hand corner, that's the room where Article 6, the carbon market mechanism, is being debated and discussed at the moment. And there are positive signs coming through that there may actually be a breakthrough. Bottom left-hand corner and the announcement that the price of coal dropped below $100 in Europe in China, while China has stepped up its own coal production and also joined the G20 nations to pledge stop to stop financing coal overseas. And then finally, the Australian mining billionaire, uh, uh, Andrew Forrest, great first name, is planning what could be up to an $8.4 billion green hydrogen investment in Argentina. The South African country's government uh, announced this on Monday after a meeting between the businessman and President uh, Alberto Fernandez on the sidelines of the COP. So what does this all mean? Well, let's bring in our guest speakers for today and get them to open up their videos and their audios and welcome them into the room. Okay, so big welcome to all three of you. And um, let's, let's welcome in order Richie Merzian from the Australian Institute. Welcome back Marty McBrien from the Climate Disclosure Standards Board and a COP novice, Melanie Bishop, Associate Professor of Biology at Macquarie University. Big welcome to you all and hello to you coming to us from Glasgow. Let's, um, let's start with Richie. Richie, you've been to a few of these now. Um, reports out of the G20 were less than positive, and the commentators are predicting that um, it actually bodes quite badly for this particular COP. But help us understand what's been the vibe uh, at the COP in the last few days, particularly as you've been on ABC News from the COP. So I'm interested in your thoughts. Sure, and, and uh, good afternoon to everyone there. So G20s are usually relatively mundane affairs in terms of the ambition agreed on in the communique. Uh, and so the fact that parties weren't able to actually land anything concrete or highly ambitious or it wasn't the kind of lead-in that Boris Johnson would have liked, I think is not surprising. The ambition usually comes at the COP when you add on you know, the 40 small island developing states, when you add on the smaller European countries like the Nordics, the ones who really do push for more ambition and hold them to account. And then you add on all the observers, um, much like we all are, that are on the edges of the conference, basically driving it and keeping it accountable. So it's not, not a big surprise or a big disappointment that the G20 didn't deliver. Uh, it just means that we need to double down on COP. And in that sense, it is good. Andrew, you went over some of the, the really good uh, additional examples. Brazil also upped its target. Take that with a grain of salt. Uh, but it is a good sign. At least they are trying to put something more ambitious forward in the short term. And the same can't be said for the Australian government. Uh, there is a bit of a buzz going on. Like the, It is great to see so many leaders here that the city is is kind of either chocked up with police and convoys um, or people trying to get into the venue um, that's a good sign and there's been relatively good energy i don't think it will close the, the emissions gap in a significant way so anyone who's expecting glasgow to be the end all will be disappointed but the incremental gains from glasgow in the way that the cop grinds on i think is still on track and, and we'll see more i think boris will be hosting a number of roundtables with leaders today focusing on transport, forests, uh, steel, and clean energy. So we'll see how many leaders actually sign up to that. These coalitions of the willing, I think, are really now the interesting part of the, the play. Interesting use of phraseology, almost 20 years since that phrase was first used. Marty, you've had time to acclimatise, and you're looking fabulous. You've had time to acclimatise to the rhythm of COP now. Anything that's jumping out to you is different from the others? Yeah, actually, the one thing that really struck me yesterday um, was there's a water pavilion this year. Water is front and centre amongst uh, sort of amongst the official blue zone, which we've never really had water spotlighted before quite like this. We've had the forests, we've had 
obviously a lot of climate and water just jumped straight out of me. I was like, where have you been? There's such important interrelated issue that so you know it's so important to Australians it's so important to a lot of the world and it's a really important you know important part of climate um that's often unheard and it may be sometimes the poor cousin so I'm delighted to see it there and maybe we'll start to see some commitment that link to that a bit like the, the um, Glasgow leader declaration for forest and land mm. use which we've been hearing about today and overnight and hopefully we'll, we'll uh, get there today okay well let's now move to our cop novice and that's Melanie Bishop um, it's your first COP. Help us understand what you're currently experiencing about being part of this, as I said yesterday, deeply important negotiation, trade fair and circus all rolled into one. Give us a sense of what you're, you're experiencing and feeling already. Yeah, so I'm here actually as part of the British delegation as one of the finalists in uh, Prince William's inaugural Earthshot Prize. And so our message here is to spread one of hope and that innovations can come from um, all manner of places around the world and all manner of organisations. And so um, we spent our first day in the Blue Zone yesterday. And um, I must admit, you know, it took me quite a while to get my head around the scale of the thing. Uh, so you mentioned the queues before. Uh, we spent about one and a half hours getting in um so um you know i guess the mind boggles at all these people and you know i guess a, a very small number of those people are involved in the negotiations directly so um you know i guess i guess all of the all the activity that happens around the side uh, so i ended up spending a lot of the day yesterday in uh what is called the pavilions area and uh, so uh, marty just touched on the water pavilion and so there's uh, pavilions from many of the nations uh ngos and then there are some around themes and so each of these pavilions actually has their own program of events, um, often with panel discussions. Um, so I spent uh, the afternoon in a very interesting nature-based solutions one, uh, which was great. Um, so yes, yeah, still very much getting my head around how everything works and the scale of things, but um, very, very um, excited to be here. It, it is vast, both in, in, in its logistics and its numbers and just the depth and breadth of the conversation that seems to go on. Richie and Mardi, well, let's talk about some of that. Um, the commitments or the pledges, or as some of them might be more accurately described, the pinky promises that have been made overnight, India, New Zealand, as you said, Brazil, uh, and Thailand, to name just a few. What's the significance of that, if any? Do you want me to jump in first? Go for, yes, go for it. <laughs> I should have named somebody. Go for it. Um, well, it, it just keeps chipping away. Uh, uh, the momentum keeps building. I mean, you have almost 200 parties to the convention and to the Paris Agreement, and each one needs to do more. That's ultimately the, the, um, the message from the IPCC. Now, we're going to hit 1.5 degrees of global warming regardless of our level of ambition. Everyone needs to do more. And the whole purpose of Glasgow, the political significance is that this is, in a sense, the anniversary of the Paris Agreement, the five-year review. So every country needs to up what it brought to the Paris Agreement and seeing countries, even if they are quite small in their emissions footprint, bring more to the table works because international diplomacy only has one kind of power mechanism, and that's peer pressure. That's it. And so you need peers to all be in the same room and to egg each other on. And that's how you slowly chip away more. It was great to see India bring something forward. Like they're often one of the most recalcitrant parties to the agreement and to actually see them put something hard on the floor is great. It actually happened right before the Australian prime minister took the floor as well. So um, these are all good. They just keep chipping away. And then that's how we will ultimately close the gap. Yeah, interesting. Marty, what's your take? I think some of the big finance contributions, you mentioned that the two billion from Australia, I mean, it's a nice start, but I think if we think about tomorrow is climate finance day. So I suspect in terms of the real announcements around money and the, the hundreds of billions or trillions that's actually needed, we will, I suspect we'll see a lot more announcements to, tomorrow, our time, Andrew, tomorrow night, your time, as, as that day sort of kicks off. And, you know, I know the UK pavilion has a, quite a few going on first thing in the morning. So I think it's a, a bit of a wait and a wait and see what we get on climate finance day to see how far we are from that money gap um, that we'll need to be thinking about across the next fortnight. Mm, okay, but in, in, interesting and important markers that have already been started, as it were, for the 
for the next few days. Let's, let's turn to Melanie and why you're at COP. You're there to share some insights and, um, on the um, important work that you do um, that's climate related. In a nutshell, tell us what you're doing and why you're there and what's been the reaction to what you're telling them? So I'm representing a project called Living Seawalls that's based out of the Sydney Institute of Marine Sciences. And Living Seawalls was one of three finalists in our Revive Our Oceans category of the Earthshot Prize. Uh, so Prince William has put forward uh, 20, sorry, 50 million pounds over 10 years um, to try and accelerate and um, scale up uh, the most promising solutions um, for repairing our world. And um, so uh, we were not selected as one of the winners this year, but nevertheless, as a finalist, um, he is personally committed to um, helping us scale up and connect us with people who will help us to do so. Uh, so yesterday, we actually had the opportunity to um, meet him uh, in a very small reception. So the uh, Duke and Duchess of Cambridge were there, the Duke and Duchess of Cornwall. Um, so... They were um, super interested in all of this and super committed to positive change. Um, so it was really great to finally meet them, um, you know, after, I guess, uh, this prize building. Take our uh, message to um, the World Leaders Summit and uh, we're going to be showcasing innovation there. So... Um, watch that space, it's going to be very exciting personally. Uh, so mm. I guess what we're seeing at the moment is this absolute boom in construction in our oceans. Uh, so uh, we're seeing a lot of um, offshore wind energy going in, which is great. Uh, we are seeing a lot of uh, coastal protection works going in as well to protect our coastal cities from um, erosion and inundation with um, rising sea levels. And so uh, these adaptation and mitigation measures are necessary, but they have um, collateral damage on our ecosystems and um, their smooth featureless surfaces just don't support um, the same biodiversity that um, natural uh, rocky reefs and habitats do. And so what we've done is um, develop a solution for returning life to our concrete coastlines and our marine built environment. Um, so we've uh, built, uh, we've uh, developed some modular habitat panels uh, that we can retrofit to new and existing structures. And so uh, hopefully during the COP, um, we will be um, developing relationships with partners to help roll this out around the world. Well, there might be a few barnacles that you need to remove from a few world leaders, um, which is my deliberate segue and pivot into my next uh, question. And it's for Richie. Let's move to the PM speech in particular. He didn't say anything necessarily new, apart from, of course, the comment in relation to the announcement, rather in relation to the two billion and not insignificant, as Marty quite rightly said. Um, did it warrant fossil of the uh, fossil of the day award, perhaps? Sure. And do we need to explain fossil of the day, Andrew? Or you I absolutely just... do. Yes, I there haven't found go. a photograph of it yet, so I do need no, to explain. I, I, I... Unfortunately, due to the COVID restrictions, they're not doing a big presentation uh, anymore. Oh, um, no. I know it's really disappointing, the dinosaur suit and everything. But basically, uh, for those uh, relatively fresh to this process, uh, the, uh, the Civil Society Network, Climate Action Network, meet every day and vote on which countries have done the most to do the least. That is to really be a handbrake on the progression of climate negotiations. And yesterday, Australia received uh, the second place award, the second fossil of the day um, of three. And that was not so much because of how it's performed here in Glasgow, given it's only really kicked off. It's more just a consequence of Australia's position. Really, Australia is providing cover. Like Australia, were complaining about China and Russia not bringing forward uh, further targets or even showing up is actually running cover for those leaders by not putting forward the 2030 target. In a sense, it's basically providing space for laggards rather than joining its allies, its forever friends, the UK and the US in putting forward more ambitious 2030 targets. I mean, the US has at least 50% cut, UK 68% cut, 
the EU 55, you know, Canada 40, Japan 46, they've all significantly increased their targets. And the G7 um, and the New Zealand and, and others that we usually hang out with have all answered the call except for Australia. So in a sense, it's contributing to the lack of ambition rather than helping to drive it. And given it is one of the most wealthy countries in the world, given it's in the top 10% of emitters, given it's the third largest exporter of fossil fuels in the world, it should and could be doing more. And I think that's why it got the award. We'll see as the negotiations actually progress how countries are performing here on the ground. But the first fossil is usually given to countries you know, due to their positions that they bring in. So I think you said they came second. Who came first? Uh, <laughs> it's fine if I you can't don't remember. remember. <laughs> I, yeah, no, I sorry, I can't remember. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it, it's always one of those events of the day that one can't help but uh, want to be at. Uh, and it's a pity because of COVID that uh, it can't physically be uh, Yeah, be it's done. usually a person in a dinosaur suit handing it out to the proxies who are there to accept it. But the interesting thing on the flip side, though, is for the first time ever, Australia actually has a physical presence, a physical public presence here at the COP uh, in actually booking out a pavilion and in the... You know, 15 odd years that I have been involved in this process, I've never seen Australia actually book out a space and build a pavilion and host events. Um, so that's kind of interesting because they've created a space for to best host this event. Um, and there was a bit of a kerfuffle there as well yesterday. Only 20, 20 years too late, but uh, technically 25 years too late. But, uh, anyway, uh, Mary Stewart has um, chimed in to say she thought that it might be the UK for the uh, came first for the length of the queues at entry. That's um, that's cruel. That's cruel. Very cruel. Marty, let's uh, let's go back to the discussion about finance, because it's one sense the deal breaker for a lot of countries in a successful outcome for this particular COP. And as you rightly pointed out yesterday, and I'm going to be using it as the mantra, this is the climate COP. Um, the PM made the announcement and the Nordic countries, I think, with the UK also made some significant announcements about funds as well. Are the developed countries now opening up their COVID battered wallets to this promised $100 billion per year commitment? Honestly, I think it's hard to say before tomorrow. I think we're going to see a lot of private finance announced and mobilised tomorrow, with, along with, with the multinationals to leverage that. We do hear a lot, and particularly here in the UK, but across Europe and more broadly about this whole build back greener, build back better post COVID. And I, and I really think that the proof is in the, in the pudding. I think there's a lot of commitments being made. And I think where, where would, you know, you know, there's a lot of commitments being made about a lot of things right at the moment. And it's the action that follows over the next six and 12 months that are really, really demonstrate if that's happened or not but you know we're just walking around and melanie you know just even melanie's idea there's not we're not short of good things for people to put their money in that will have have a difference and that is one of the nice things about uh, being inside the blue zone and and also just the green zone which is the some more public access area is actually just walking around and seeing all these absolute fantastic scalable initiatives that can help you know, meet our targets and meet our objectives that when you sit writing counting you know counting standards for climate and environmental and social mm. issues you, you sometimes get a bit detached from actually the real world really good work that is going on to help us meet meet this gap and meet meet the ambition and where we need to get to so th there's lots of things for those money lots of really good things for that money to go into yeah i'm, re I'm really glad you made that point because it's one of the things that's not often talked about it about the cop about how so much is brought to the COP of good work that is being done right around the world and it needs a light to be shone on it. Let me wrap up uh, the conversation with the three of you by asking you, what are you going to be watching and looking out for today, your day? Uh, let's start with Melanie. So we've actually got a uh, fairly full schedule planned by Earthshot. Uh, so we're going to start the day meeting with their global alliance of partners um, who are going to talk about how they're going to help us scale up our solutions. Uh, we have a meeting with the um, UN uh, later in the morning and then in the afternoon we're going to be at the um, World Summit of um, Leaders uh, presenting our solutions to them um, and, and meeting them and um, um, getting their commitment. Wow. Okay. Well, that's not nothing. That's pretty damn exciting. Um, let's, uh, Richie, what are you going to be, what are you going to be doing? Tapping on the door of Article yeah. 6, what are you going to be doing? 
No, nothing, nothing, nothing too exciting. I feel a bit sheepish coming in after Melanie. That sounds awesome. <laughs> um, so uh, we're launching some research today, uh, which basically shows that uh, net zero by 2050 is a fraud if fossil fuels flourish. And currently there's a massive pipeline of coal and gas projects in Australia. We've just quantified the emissions that that would release if all scope one, two, three emissions were realized from that pipeline. Uh, and we'll be launching that today when hopefully getting a pretty decent run while the press pack are all still here looking for stories around how Australia is, is ultimately operating in the COP. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, we should talk about the media and on another, another occasion. Um, thank you, Mark. The question before we go to Marty is, what are the issues currently being discussed today, the bingo or engo? Uh, we'll park that one because the bingo meetings don't actually start until the third so and they're going to be live and virtual if you want to go to them so uh, i would strongly suggest that if any of the audience is interested in that go onto the icc website and follow the trickle path to register for their event and that will then give you the access to the daily i think 8 30 to 9 briefings that they're going to be holding i know that um, i certainly will be going to them but um Mademoiselle McBrien, what are you going to be doing today with that fantastic coloured outfit? I know I've got a really busy day. I won't get back before my black tie event tonight, so I have to be well all day today. It's one of those one of those days. So no, actually, I'm speaking at a couple of financing water private sector events today. Uh, so water for me, which is what really draw my attention to the water pavilion yesterday. I just thought these were sort of ad hoc events, but actually very much part of that. And then uh, later this afternoon, we're hosting um, with the International Federation of Accountants and uh, World Business Council for Sustainable Development and a few others, we're hosting a, a sort of a, an event uh, in the blue zone on accounting for climate. So using existing, you know, it, it's not optional to report financial information. Why is it optional to report information on ESG and climate? So we're running an accounting for climate event on that. So that, that sort of links to the financing agenda. And then tonight I'm presenting a Finance for the Future Award so for those of you that don't know, every year, A4S Deloitte and the ICW in UK run a global prize. Global awards are all of you out there with fantastic reporting. Think about it for next year. And uh, basically, it's to call out the best reporters in sustainability in the world, um, leading to financial reporting. And it, you know, it's under A4S and Prince Charles, everyone. Big, big thing. And I'm presenting the Moving, Moving the Markets Award tonight from live from Glasgow. So that's the pink dress and I'm ready to go. So really, uh, really exciting day. And then, of course, tomorrow is Climate Finance Day and the, the big one for us. Yeah. And in one sense, the, the, the COP really begins tomorrow. Uh, when the so-called leaders leave and the hard work actually begins by the negotiators and um, all parties associated with it. Thank you so much for joining us, all three of you. Um, as we wrap up, the Business Council for Sustainable Development Australia, Good COP Barometer. It will be back thanks to those who responded to our COP Barometer yesterday. I can assure you it's taking the soundings very seriously and we'll be back with you later in the week when we have a stronger sense of progress or not, and to leave you with one final bit of announcement, which I can't forget, because she's actually online, and that is our very own Mary Stewart, the CEO of Energetics, will be joining a world-leading panel this evening at a um, blue event, a blue uh, zone event being hosted by the Women Business Coalition with parties, including ourselves and our colleagues at the um, Sustainable Business Council New Zealand. So cancel your Australian TV viewing tonight, whether you are going to watch Dumb and Dumber 2, Love Island, Australia, Escape to the Chateau, Tomorrow it Never Dies, although that could be prescient in this case, um, or Olympus Has Fallen, again, disturbingly prescient. Um, because the live stream um, of Mary Stewart at this event will be um, up on the, um, up, uh, what is it going through? It's actually going through YouTube, I think, which is very exciting. And you can access uh, the link through the We Mean Business Coalition at wemeanbusinesscoalition.org forward slash COP26 dash boardroom dash live forward slash. Apologies that I haven't been able to put it through the uh, the Zoom link itself. All right, last thing is to say tomorrow, 3rd of November, we'll be joined by 
not three, but five speakers. Marty will once again join us for her last visitation for this week. And we're very excited that she can return and tell us all about what's been announced. We're also joined by John Carstensen uh, at Mock McDonald. Karen James, the global CEO of ERM, will be with us. Matthew Warnken, if he's actually arrived, uh, will be with us as well. And a very dear friend, Joanne Yowich, who is the CEO of my counterpart in South Africa from the National Business Initiative, will also be joining us. So we look forward to having you then. Uh, as always, respect the science, respect nature, and respect each other. I'm Andrew Peterson. Thank you so much for joining us and talk to you very soon. Bye for now.